Once again, loving Father, it is a privilege and an honor to study the Word of God. Uh, may God the Holy Spirit help us to understand the things which we look at, that to the end result that our Lord and Savior may be glorified. In Jesus' dear name, amen. Well, we're studying the doctrine of grace. We have looked at pre salvation grace. Grace is always unearned, always undeserved. We saw under pre salvation grace what's called common grace, in which God, the Holy Spirit, makes the gospel understandable to the individual could never understand it apart from the doctrine of common grace. At the same time, he issues what is calling grace, and that is the invitation that God gives, God the Father gives, to the unbelieving sinner to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ at that point in time. Then we come to what is called saving grace, and we have studied under that the principle of efficacious grace in which this person who now understands the gospel and utilizes his volition is not saved. He cannot be saved just because he changes his volition unless God the Holy Spirit makes his faith effective for salvation. A very important thing that 90%, maybe 99% of all Christians are ignorant of. See, there is nothing in depraved, uh, spiritually dead, brain dead man that can ever function apart from grace. So efficacious grace makes his faith effective for salvation. The second thing is the 40 things that God does for the believer, or 40 blessings of grace, as we've called it, that God bestows on the believer at the point of salvation, though you feel none of them. Now we're into the third area, which is living grace. And under living grace, there are three divisions. The first is called logistical grace and uh, those who would agree to this point are completely lost over here because they do not understand what logistical grace means again it is everything that God the Father God the Son and God the Holy Spirit can do for the believer to sustain him and to bless him in this life totally apart from merit of any kind so that he can advance spiritually. This is life support for every believer. You can't earn it. You haven't deserved it. There's no work you can accomplish. And whether you're a winner or a loser, whether you're in fellowship or out of fellowship, whether you're carnal or spiritual, whether you are uh, on fire for the Lord or whether you are in apostasy, you are the recipient of logistical grace. And so is everybody else. And this, is, this doesn't rest well with legalists. You mean to say that I am at Bible class every opportunity and uh, I read my Bible every day, I pray every day, I, I give, I witness, I, and so-and-so, my, my sister-in-law, who uh, uh, was born again at one time, uh, but uh, now doesn't attend and doesn't and doesn't and doesn't. You mean to say that we're both the recipients of logistical grace? What's the meaning of grace? It that means that it doesn't increase with your merit nor decrease with her demerit. No. It is everything that God can do to keep you alive in the devil's world 
so that when, if and when you make a decision to believe, to, to go beyond belief and to grow in grace, you are able to be blessed. And the basis of logistical grace is the fact that God's integrity must bless righteousness wherever it is. It has to be that way. And you see, the moment you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, God imputes to the believing sinner in the doctrine of imputation the absolute righteousness which belongs to Jesus Christ. Now, since this believer it has been justified or declared righteous, declared plus R, it doesn't mean you are plus R, it means you're declared that way in the sight of God. Now, therefore, the justice of God must bless the righteousness of God wherever it's found. And this doesn't ask whether the believer is in or out of fellowship, good or bad, or carnal or spiritual, or in reversionism, or in fragmentation of soul, or whatever. It simply asks the question, is he born again? If he is, he then is the recipient of the imputation of blessing. Blessing must come from the justice of God to the righteousness of God wherever it is found. And we looked at several passages uh, about this subject, but uh, logistical grace is the basis for the perpetuation of the believer's life in time. Supporting gives you everything that you will need for living and for god -like Provides for your temporal needs, such as food, shelter, clothing, transportation, environment, time, a job. Provides for your security. The assignment of guardian angels to protect you in the angelic conflict. The wall of fire for your spiritual advance. Eternal security regarding salvation. The spiritual provisions which are made so that you can grow in grace in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then we took some time to look at the logistical grace rationale in Matthew chapter 6 verses 25 to 34, where we saw that uh, there are commands there not to worry because God's logistical grace is given without measure. It is not given because you ask for it. It is not given because you are uh, pray for it. It is not given because you uh, are uh, so good. It is given on the basis of who and what God is, and everybody gets it. You are therefore not to worry more things you worry about, the more you increase the power of fear in your life. You are simply to relax and allow God's logistical grace to provide everything that you have need of in this life. We talked about performance and falling into the performance trap, thinking that especially if you've got some special uh, test coming up or uh, maybe you're going to go to the doctor and uh, have been feeling bad uh, and you before you go you want to check up did I have my devotions have I, have I had any impure thoughts have I have I had any uh, uh, any mental attitude sins or sins of the tongue cross my mouth because why because you want to earn or deserve when, a good report when you get to the doctor that's what you want and you can't do it that's great it's not grace Grace tells you that you are blessed by God on the basis of who and what God is and not on the basis of what you can earn or deserve. We're so oriented to getting things on the basis of earning or deserving it or being entitled to them because we are such and such that we fail to realize all that God has provided for us in logistical grace. And we began in our last Bible class working on the second of the three provisions of living grace. And that is, the first one uh, is, uh, uh, as I have now pointed out, uh, the principle of logistical grace. The second is correcting grace or disciplining grace. Disciplining grace. Now, the first thing that the so-called holiness crowd jumps on <laughs> at this point is, what about the believer who sins? Even those who believe in eternal security, as we do, accuse us of, quote, going too far with this wonderful doctrine. And so they come up with the old cliche, well, a, a believer who sins... Uh, keeps on sinning, was never saved in the first place. 
The great error of all these facts, these statements, is that they fail to understand the finished work of Christ on the cross of Calvary. Never forget that. There is no sin for which Christ did not die. No sin. No one will ever be in hell because he's a sinner. John 3, 18, He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed on the only begotten Son of God. Therefore, sin is no longer the issue in the human race. The Lord Jesus Christ is the issue in the human race. Having believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, one is therefore eternally saved. All sin has been paid for. Uh, and uh, uh, therefore, where do these heretics get off claiming that after salvation, the believer has to pay for sinning when, he is, uh, when he's out of fellowship? That he somehow has to pay for his own sins now? Are they... Are, are the uh, sins that the believer commits after salvation more important than the sins which were committed before salvation? All sin was paid for by Christ on the cross. Well, what does that mean, therefore, that the believer should sin with impunity? <laughs> well, certainly not. But this point on, it's a matter of the Heavenly Father dealing with his royal family. And it's grace because none of us ever gets what we deserve. None, none of us. We never get what we deserve. And we began by talking about the problems that believers uh, face, the problems uh, in the area of sin. And we saw four of them. First of all, involvement with the world system. Secondly, the uh, problem of carnality, that is, the problem of the old sin nature. Thirdly, we saw the problem of reversionism, which the world often calls backsliding. And fourthly, we found the problem of soul fragmentation. And... Uh, with these four areas that the believer faces regarding the areas of sin, God has had to do something. And so the second thing we noted was the intervention of God. And what does God do in His intervention? Well, the first thing is by precept. That is, the precept, he, by means of Bible teaching, he seeks to keep the believer from sinning. All Scripture is God-breathed, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. And that's what God provides. It is the infallible, inerrant scripture, as taught by your right pastor teacher, that rebukes the sinning, corrects error in the life, and guides the believer into paths of righteousness. Which tells us that the believer needs the local church. Many years ago, I heard the late Bishop Sheen say something to the effect that you have been told to attend the church of your choice. Of course, he said, that's wrong. You are to attend the church of God's choice. And of course, he was referring to the Roman Catholic Church. We know that. But he had a point, a good point. There are all kinds of churches out there offering everything from musical programs to counseling to meetings ad nauseum. In fact, we were reading before class uh, in our share in time about uh, uh, what's going on in the world out there and what people are looking for as far as the church is concerned and ran across uh, the uh, exhortation by one man to take, if people aren't uh, coming to your church, take the church to the mall. 
Anyway, this is what he said. He told attendees at a church growth conference last month that unchurched Americans are attracted to congregations that offer varied special interest activities like divorce recovery workshops, community sports programs, financial seminars, and dinner theater presentations. That's what they want in the church. Well, uh, let's forget about what people want in a church. Let's find out what God wants in a church. After all, who cares what people want in a church? Forget about whether the church is friendly, conveniently located, air-conditioned, has a babysitting society for your teenager, a nursery with all the latest equipment. Forget about the pastor's personality, about his bedside manner. I'm convinced that the church is undergoing fantastic discipline in America because they're orienting themselves to the programs on the basis of what makes them popular with certain demographic groups so they can attract the crowds. The question should never be, what kind of a church are you looking for? It should be, what kind of a church does God say it should be? The People don't care, so they're looking for the church that meets all the needs of their family so they don't have to do any of that stuff. But the church is what the, the church must be, the church that is communicating the truth of Bible doctrine that uh, from the original Greek and Hebrew, so that you know, thus saith the Lord. And so the first is uh, the intervention of God in, in providing for uh, the believers uh, handling sin is the precept of Bible teaching, the availability of Bible teaching, so that doctrine can do the things which it is designed to do. The second thing is found uh, is uh, uh, divine discipline. Now I hope you and I uh, understand one thing. There's no such thing as a perfect child. I've just insulted a few people who thought that their children were perfect. And at least one child over here who thinks she's perfect. <laughs> if you've never spanked your child, you have failed as a parent. Not that you have to beat them up, but the child who has been properly trained and disciplined will have to be spanked from time to time. And if not, they invariably grow up to be a source of misery to themselves, to their parents, and to the society in general. But children are not only imperfect, they are also hard-headed. They don't learn much by precept. Uh, in other words, uh, it doesn't do any good for mother to sit down and say, Now, Charlie, this is why I want you not to climb the curtains. Charlie doesn't climb the curtains because the authority says don't climb the, the curtain. And he doesn't need to know why the authority says don't climb the curtain. But this analogy is drawn between children and believers because as long as we live on this earth we continue to have all sin natures. We will never be free from sinning while we are in the body because the old sin nature is resident in every cell of the human body. Only when we get rid of this body will we get rid of the old sin nature. And from the source of the old sin nature we consistently make bad decisions. And as a result we get ourselves into T-R-U-B-B-L-E or if you spell it correctly trouble. And as a result of this, we make ourselves miserable under self-induced misery. There are three phases of the, uh, the self, uh, 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 this self-misery thing. We'll talk about that later. But uh, under self-produced uh, uh, misery, but uh, this is, is normal. We're going to go through this all of our lives because of the law of volitional responsibility. In other words, the point simply says this, 
when you make a bad decision and get yourself into trouble, you must assume the responsibility because you made that decision yourself. Now, God being fair and loving, unlike many earthly fathers, will bless on certain occasions. He will discipline on certain occasions. But understand this. Discipline is simply, in God's eyes, child training. Child training. Like human discipline, child training is designed to produce humility in the child or in the believer. And as such, the humility in the believer becomes a motivating force for his spiritual advance. You see, only under humility can you become truly objective in life. And objectivity produces orientation to reality. You cannot understand reality apart from humility and objectivity. And divine discipline orients believers to reality. Now, this kicks in for every believer. And if you'll turn with me to the passage we were studying in Hebrews chapter 12, we're talking about divine discipline, which is teaching from the grace of God. Now, beloved, I have given you two ways, and one is the easy way, the other is the hard way. There is no other way in the Christian way of life. The easy way is to learn by precept. The hard way is to learn by discipline. If you're a smart believer, you are going to learn from the Word of God. You are going to obey the Word of God. If you are a stupid believer like most of us, you're going to not kick in to obey the Word of God until you go through the uh, disciplines of life, the heartaches and the hardships of life that will cause you to stop short where you're heading and uh, go return to the precepts which are given. So let's take a few sub-points under one definition. What is the definition of divine discipline? First of all, it is the sum total of God's punitive action in grace to correct, to punish, to encourage, to train, and to motivate the believer, the free will of the believer, to function within the per protocol plan of God. Therefore, point two, or sub point B, divine discipline is to be distinguished from divine judgment. Divine judgment is on unbelievers for uh, directed toward all categories of the human race and angels under certain circumstances. Divine discipline is for believers only, and it is very carefully meted out. It's a T. What happens is that when the believer gets out of fellowship, he's controlled by his old sin nature. Therefore, he sins, and when he sins, he functions either under human good and evil, or he functions under uh, the devil's uh, world, uh, darkness, uh, cosmic system is either in reversionism and or fragmentation. So 
So he's in these four areas. In this condition, he brings suffering on himself because God has to correct him. God must correct him. Unlike the parents, human parents, God is a perfect parent to every member of the royal family, and therefore he must correct. Please notice this. God never disciplines to get even. God never disciplines because he's mad at you. God never disciplines you in anger. God never disciplines because he's had it up to here with you. God never, ever disciplines except for the purpose of straightening you out and sending you in the right direction. And you will never, ever be disciplined in accordance with how much you deserve it. You, all of his discipline is tempered by grace. And this grace is fantastic because it is in up to the sovereignty of God, which is the ingenuity of God in how he disciplines his believers. He brings a suffering into the believer's life. And in the suffering, he is trying to get the attention of the believer, call the attention of the believer to the fact that he is erring, that he is, uh, he is moving into one of those four areas we've talked about. And the suffering that he brings into the life or allows to come into the life, uh, is never as great as it ought to be. We, are, we will study the example uh, of uh, one man uh, later on. But uh, it is very important to realize that this suffering that God brings is special. And, and another thing we should understand, and that is the fact that Divine discipline should be distinguished from this self-produced misery. You see, you, you can have self-imposed misery, self-induced misery, and self-indulged misery. Different, different, different areas, but it's all, it all comes from yourself. These all come from the source of bad decisions which you make. And the law of, the, of, uh, of volitional responsibility simply says you have to assume the responsibility for the decisions that you have made. And the result will always be discomfort. It will always be misery. It will always be unhappiness. And it may last for a long time. It may last for a short time. But self-induced misery is something you bring on yourself. This is not related to divine discipline. Many times we fail to understand that. If you go out and rob a bank when you're young and get shot in the leg, when you get right with God, God isn't going to grow a new leg. You'll live with the suffering of that leg all of your life as a result of self-imposed misery. You did it. You made a decision. You made a stupid decision. You have had a, a, a marital problems. You made a stupid decision. Well, you are the one who indulged your own uh, emotions and brought this on you. And uh, uh, it, they're not going to go away. God's not going to rub over with holy water. 
you see, rebound doesn't affect this kind of a thing. This is something that comes on on yourself. In fact, the fact that all, everything comes from our free will doesn't mean that it comes from the same source. You see, uh, here's uh, the, the, the self-produced uh, misery. That comes from, from your use of your free will, but so does sinning. You see, you choose to sin. You make a free will decision to sin. And uh, uh, all of the, that comes from your free will but because they both come from your free will doesn't mean they both come from the same source. The law of volitional responsibility produces certain miseries that come from here. The misery that comes from here is God-imposed, and that is divine discipline. But all discipline is designed to correct, to train, or to motivate. All right, in our passage, which we began looking at, Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 4, it says, you have, it begins by saying that you have not, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted unto blood. Now, the, the word sin is preceded by the definite article, the sin, the word is hamartia, H-A-M-A-R-T-I-A, -A, and that refers to the old sin nature when it's preceded by the definite article. Now, the resisting unto blood is an idiom. We talked about it. It, it means the same as Romans 13, 14, which says, Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill it in the lusts thereof. The provision for the flesh is this word in the Greek. P-R-O-N-O-I-A. Noia is uh, the mind or to think. Pro is before. To think before. Or it, it may be translated forethought or provision. The believer doesn't see how close he can come to sinning, but stays as far away as possible. And we talked a bit about that the other day. The principle being that to resist the old sin nature uh, is, with, unto blood, to resist unto blood, is simply making no provision for the flesh. Okay, uh, uh, he says in 1 John 2, 1, My childish children, these things I write to you, that you sin not. That's his will. That's what he wants. That's obviously his perfect will. However, if anyone sins, we keep on having a defense attorney, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Uh, he's face to face with the Father. And so we do have the, the occasion, what happens if we do sin. But uh, the point is that uh, these believers have failed in the area that they have not. Uh, they have made provision for the flesh. They had gone back to the temple worship, uh, which uh, is not a part of the of our uh, problem today. All right, the second uh, is found in uh, 12, 5 gives us some wrong attitudes. And we note the first one. It says, And you yourselves have totally forgotten the principles of doctrine which keep on addressing and reasoning with you for your advantage as to adult sons. My son, stop making light of the child training from the source of the Lord. Stop becoming debilitated while you're being reproved for correction under his authority. There are three things that are in this verse. Two are very clear. The first thing is to remember, don't forget Bible doctrine. That's the first injunction. That's the best advice anybody could ever give you. To think the mind of Christ, to think the word of God, to remember doctrine. The psalmist asked the question in Psalm 119, verse 9 and 11. Uh, how can a young man keep his way pure? Answer, by living according to your word. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. We used to have an old cliche, but it's still true. Either sin will keep you from the word, or the word will keep you from sin. 
But the, the attitude second is, stop making light. This is a very interesting word in the original Greek. Uh, it is uh, this word. Allegoreo. O-L-I-G-O-R-E-O. Allegoreo means to disregard. It means to regard something as small and insignificant. It means to fail to appreciate. Uh, Lenski in his commentary says, it means to fail to appreciate what the Lord has done for his sons and to desire to be rid of his chastisement and his reproof. The positive side of allegoreo would be, learn from it, stupid. That's the Pauli translation. But that's, what the, that's the opposite side of it. In other words... How many children are there who never seem to learn from the corrective words of their parents, even from the discipline? The parents will uh, slap their hands uh, and say no. Slap their hands and say no. The parents will say no, stay away from that. Say no, don't do that. And, and the famous word, Charlie Brown, how many times have I told you not to do? Well, you see, they don't learn. They don't even learn from spankings. They don't even learn from uh, uh, being set in the corner. They don't learn from these things. And so uh, they're, they're like, uh, they're making light of the discipline. I had a father come to me many years ago talking about a boy who was, uh, he was an SOB, a son of Belial. He was really a terrible kid. And uh, he said, I took, and I spanked my son, and, and he looked up at me and laughed in my face. And uh, you see what he was doing? He was making light. And so what did the father do? The father gave up on, divine, on, his, on, on the human discipline. Sure, couldn't take it. But the point is, this is an encouragement to take it to heart. By the way, Dr. Weiss describes discipline in a very interesting way. He's describing this word paideia, which is child training or discipline. Looks like this in the Greek. P-A-I-D-E-I-A. -E he says, it speaks also, uh, it, is, it is used of the whole training and education of children. It speaks of whatever in adults cultivates the soul, especially correcting mistakes and curbing passions. It speaks of instruction, which aims at the increase of virtue. The word doesn't have in it the idea of punishment, but of corrective measures which will eliminate evil in the life and encourage the good. So, the first wrong attitude, well, is remembered, or don't forget. Don't forget doctrine. The second, don't make light of it. Uh, look upon every divine discipline as serious, serious enough to stop you in your tracks, and to say to God, well, uh, sir, what is it that you want me to learn from this experience? Then the third wrong area is given in the other words, stop becoming uh, uh, debilitated. Uh, the word uh, is, is, both of these, uh, this word is faint. Uh, it's the, the translation of this Greek word, ek luo, and both of them are uh, present tense plus the negative, meaning to stop doing something you are doing. The word means to uh, loosen, unloosen, relax, or to, uh, to so enfeeble. It carries the connotation of becoming discouraged as one undergoes reproving from God. Well, I don't know about you, but um, uh, there's a song that I really can identify with that I've heard it I don't know if it was popular or is popular or has been or it used to go I was born to reject rejection I I can't take rejection I can't be a salesman I tried to be a salesman I took every rejection personally now a salesman can't do that if a guy if a man's gonna be a good salesman he can't take rejection personally he has to let it roll off of his back and go on uh, and and uh, sell someone else 
I used to take every one personally. I took every turn down as a personal rejection. And therefore, and rejection discouraged me. And if you're discouraged, you can't be a good salesman, you see. But uh, here's what happens. We make plans. We set up the goals. Uh, we make decisions. And God rejects them. Now, it's one thing to be rejected by a person. But it's another thing to be rejected by God simply because we understand this. We know that God loves us with an everlasting love. We know that His grace never, ever makes a mistake. Can His grace ever do anything for you that is not good? Of course not. That's why we, we walk by faith, not by sight. That's why we, we don't tell God what's best for us. If we know Him, why should I go to God and say, Oh God, do this. He knows what's best for me. He's going to do what's best for me. He can't do anything but what's best for me, can He? How could the God who gave us, the Lord Jesus Christ, do anything less than the best for us? The uh, our fortiori argument, which we've already looked at. In Romans chapter 8, verses 30 and 31. And therefore, when God rejects our plans... When God rejects our decisions, it's because He loves us and he, he wants to correct our course. He wants to correct the direction we're taking. And out of love, we accept this and we don't become discouraged when our plans don't work out. That's why he says in James... The, the, those of you who say uh, today or tomorrow we'll go there uh, to this and that city and we'll uh, uh, do this or that. Uh, and he said, hold, hold, hold on. Uh, you who say that. You should say, the, if the Lord wills, we will do this or that or the other thing. He doesn't say don't plan. He doesn't say don't make uh, 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 choices. He says always temper your decisions, your choices with these statements if the Lord wills. And not just make that as a pious statement, but may, make it as a part of your thinking. If the Lord is willing, this is the direction we're going to go. If He's not willing, then we know He'll stop us. And you don't have, you don't have to pray. I mean, I've heard people say, pray, oh Lord, uh, if this isn't the right direction, stop me. That's stupid. He's not, you don't have to ask Him to do that. He's going to do it, dummy. What do you think, he's going to let you do it because you don't ask? You say, God, now don't stop me. I want to go. That's dumb. Of course not. Ridiculous. He loves us. Therefore, he corrects us. And when he rejects us, we don't become discouraged or faint. We don't have soul fainting. So uh, when he says, uh, you yourselves have totally forgotten the principles of doctrine, which keep on addressing and reasoning with you for your advantage as to adult sons. Colon. Here's how the doctrine reasons with you. My son, stop making light of the child training from the source of the Lord. First thing. Second, stop becoming debilitated. Stop becoming discouraged from uh, uh, when you are being reproved for correction under His authority. Then in verse 6, we have the two stages of the three stages of divine discipline given to us. Hebrews 12, 6. For you see, whom the Lord loves, there's the word, whom the Lord loves, he, well, we'll use the first one, teaches by discipline. It's also called the warning stage of discipline. Warning discipline. All right? Whom the Lord loves, he teaches by discipline and punishes to the maximum. Translated King James, scourges. Means to skin alive with a whip. And so I'll translate it, punishes to the maximum. 
And that is the intensified stage of discipline. So he says, for you see whom the Lord loves, he teaches by discipline and punishes to the maximum. Please note who? Every son or child, and you know, you male or female, every child whom he receives and cherishes. Verse 8 adds, suppose you keep on being without corrective discipline, of which all believers have become participants. Then what? then you are what? Illegitimate. And are not sons or children in the family at all. Just remember, thank God for child training. Thank God for discipline. Thank God for these things. Because it proves you're a son. There's a good illustration. Take your Old Testament and turn to 1 Samuel for a moment. First Samuel, you have a poor father. His name was Eli. He was a priest to whom Samuel was given by his mother and father as a child to train for the priesthood. So Samuel was to be going to become a priest and a prophet. But Eli was the high priest. And to chapter 2, verse 12, Eli's sons were wicked men. They had no regard for the Lord. You see? Now, uh, uh, verse uh, 22, uh, Eli, who was very old, heard about everything his sons were doing to all Israel and how they slept with women who served at the entrance of the tent of meeting and as a... Uh, uh, he said to them, Why do you do such things? Oh, what a great man. Uh, uh, I hear from all the people about these wicked deeds of yours. No, my sons, it is not a good report that I hear spreading among the Lord's people. Well, anyway, now uh, let's look over to God's prophecy in chapter 3. The Lord speaks to Samuel in verse 11. Chapter 3, verse Samuel 3.11. The Lord says to Samuel, See, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears it tingle. In other words, he's going to, he's going, going to, uh, this is going to be so loud, everyone's going to hear it. This is, a, this is something that's very important. All right, at that time I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from the beginning to the end. Verse 13, For I told him that I would judge his family forever, because of the sin he knew about, his sons made themselves contemptible, and he failed to restrain them. He was a rotten father, and he therefore committed the sin unto death. And you find the sin unto death in chapter 4, verses 10 to 18, in his failure as a father. He failed to restrain his sons. Now, God is not like that. I mean, that's the illustration of a father who doesn't really love his children. He may say he uh, uh, loves, but he's an indulgent father. Merrill Unger says that the enormity of his sins was an insult to God since he was a priest. And it was the sin unto death for Eli. Now, these two words which are used in tandem, the word uh, paideia here and the word mastiques, which looks like this. I didn't give it to you, I guess. M-A-S-T-I-X, which is the word for skinning alive with a whip, seem to indicate that God always begins with warning discipline and moves to intensified discipline. And actually, it leads to a third stage the sin unto death for those who fail to be taught by it. In 1 Corinthians 11.30, Paul explains the disastrous results of failing to confess known sin before taking communion. Quote, that is why many among you are weak, that's warning discipline, and sick, 
That is intensified discipline. And a number of you have fallen asleep. That's the sin of the death. For, uh, and uh, we'll pick it up at the purpose of these, of these things and uh, the illustration. We have an outstanding illustration of something that perhaps uh, it may be new to, uh, to some of you, and that is installment discipline. I'm going to teach you the doctrine of installment discipline. God has some discipline which is so severe, He has to meet, meet it out in installments. And I'll show you that in, next, uh, in our next class. We do encourage those who are watching by television or listening by radio to write for the booklet on grace. All of this material is contained in it, and it will be available to you free for the asking. No one will call on you or put any pressure on you in any way. Now let us pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for our study. May God the Holy Spirit help us to appreciate these things and to apply them to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.